guest today is Jim Pilkington, who witnessed the crash of the Hindenburg. It burst into flames. It burst into flames and it's falling. It's crazy. Watch it. Watch it. It's crashing terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning, bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks agree that this is terrible. This is one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, 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 it's a space running oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky. And it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now. And the frame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the passengers screaming around it. I told you, I can't even talk to people whose friends are out there. It's, 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 uh, oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. I can't. Listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because I've lost the voice. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. The Hindenburg was a tour ship, a passenger ship. And uh, I don't know whether it carried any cargo or not, only maybe the luggage and so forth. But um, it, it, it was constructed in Germany, and it was making trips across the Atlantic. And uh, of course, I went to, to a newspaper to find out about the Hindenburg, whether it would be on time or late. And I was told that it was 12 hours late due to the fact it was fighting a storm coming across the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Hindenburg arrived here, it didn't stop at Lakehurst. It went up the Atlantic coast, went around the Empire State Building, and came back to the field. Well, now, Lakehurst. is this the first trip that the Hindenburg made? No, no. I think I had made several trips. Well, now, why were you at the scene? Well, I was at the scene because I had one of awards selling. And, of course, uh, like I could say, my award was a tour of the Hindenburg. Now, because it was a long trip in those days, I mean, we're going back 51 years. Mm -hmm. And because it was a long trip in those days, he allowed me to take a friend along with me. So I took this fellow along with me. His name, of course, was uh, Rich Streelman, and he's now deceased. And uh, we got down there, of course, the following morning. We were supposed to be there the night before, but we got down there the following morning. And we hung around and waited, and they put us to work. And of course, they signed me up, both of us, I should say, signed us both up as crew members of the Hindenburg because no, uh, no one was allowed on the Hindenburg, I mean, touring the Hindenburg. And the only ones down there, of course, would be the Hindenburg crew members and, of course, the Navy Department. Well, that's why you had these white coveralls then. That's right. So I was given the white coveralls to wear that day, plus an officer hat. But I don't know what happened to the officer hat, but it's gone. So when I got down there, I was supposed to see this fellow by the name of Emil Hoff, who was in charge, of course, of the Hindenburg crew. Now, Emil Hoff was uh, trained in Germany. And he knew every phase of that ship from one end to the other. And he signed me up as a crew member of the Hindenburg. That's the only way I was going to get on the Hindenburg, you know, and uh, view it. So anyway, the result was that uh, we were working all day heating oil because there were four motors on that Hindenburg, and each motor held 150 gallons of oil. So we had these 55-gallon drums with heating rods in them. And we stood there in the rain all day, it was raining all day, shaking these drums back and forth because it was an SAA-50, and we had to heat it to the flow of an SAA-10, so it would go up the pipes and go into the motors. Then, when I got to the middle of the ship, I stood there waiting for him to drop the platform from the belly of the ship so I could go up into the ship. And uh, while we were waiting, like I say, if it had been a couple of seconds uh, later, we'd have been on that platform. We wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here today to talk about it. So anyway, while we were standing there, waiting for this platform to come down, it looked like uh, somebody struck a match. And there was a little flame come out the side of the bag. Now, when we saw that, then the bag started to burn from the middle to the end, rear end. And uh, 
my friend stood there and he was paralyzed with fear. He couldn't move. So I grabbed him by the arm and I twisted him around and I said, run. And I think that day we broke, broke all track records. Mm, I bet. And in the gondola, we saw him jumping out of the windows to the ground, landing in the sand, saw him running, saw people with the, the backs bare uh, flesh, skin burnt right on off. Well, about how many people were on the ship? I'd say approximately it had to be in the 70s or 80s because uh, the way I understand, there were 30 um, people, of course, that didn't make it. And uh, I think it was something like 36 or better that were saved. Well, now, were there Americans on, <clears throat> on board, too? Oh, yes, it was a tour ship, you know, and uh, they had, uh, well, as a matter of fact, there was one woman from Chicago that this Amal Hoff had pulled out of the gondola. I see. And uh, I know she rewarded him later on. And, of course, I don't think he lived that long to uh, even enjoy it, whatever it was. Um, well, I know that you must have lived with this all your life and probably have had a lot of bad memories once in a while. Uh, even to talk about it, you get <laughs> shaky, you know. But I want to thank you for letting us visit with you today and to tell us a little bit about what happened. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you for dropping by. Three, one, 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 nine. Now, there's one more note about this hidden treasure. After the Hindenburg crashed, it was reported on the radio that the entire ground crew was killed. But they weren't because Jim Pilkington was alive and he was trying to get word through to his wife that he was still alive. The telephone lines were down and couldn't, and he could not reach her. Finally, with the help of the police, word did get through that her husband had not been killed. And after hearing the news, she promptly fainted, and I don't really blame her.